lots of DRI people here today. I love it. That's I great. love it. I can't believe that you know, three and a half years of being a certification commissioner, it was the first time that, that <laughs> I'm actually somebody, meeting Brock. You know. uh, waking up at two in the morning. No, 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 thanks. I would say no, thank you. No. But we all do what we, we have to do. I, you know, Brock echoed again the excitement and energy of yeah. being in person that he had forgotten what yeah. it was like to, to be with people. It did. Well, it, it does feel different. You know, it, like I said uh, it, earlier, Louisville, I was a little bit more nervous because it was the first time, but it feels so much better th this time around, you know, uh, be, being with people. I'm not as nervous. I'm not as ang anxious and getting to, to meet, you know, Brock and Chloe and other people. You know, I saw Renzo who was standing here in front yeah, of us. He was frantically um, waving us down. We yeah, ignored so, him. Our apologies. You know, that's the first time I've actually seen Renzo in person. And I've been dealing with Renzo at DRI for years. And that's the first time I've seen him in person. So I have to, I have to hunt him down before I leave today. Uh, Brock said earlier, you know, you love all your kids equally and he didn't want to, he wasn't sure if he liked certifications or awards better which of his children uh in full disclosure having won a dri award and also being dri certified i certainly know which one is more fun <laughs> i know which one is more valuable and important to my clients in my career but i also know which one is more fun we'll just leave that <laughs> leave that like that i guess so we have uh We've only got 20 minutes left. We had a We've nice long talk minutes. with Brock. Uh, Alex, so. we can talk about some general topics. Okay. Or we have some things that have happened in the news in the last 24 hours. Which, what would you like to, to finish off this hour? With? Oh, let's go with what's in the news. All right, let's go with what's in the news. Um, See if we can put a resilience business continuity spin on it. So I was, you know, always trying to find some local news. I like when we were in Louisville. We focus on a lot of business continuity and risk issues in Louisville, uh, trying to be a good Canadian this week, trying to find my Canadian news. So uh, yesterday, British Columbia's provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, uh, rejected calls for a mandatory mask order, even as hospitals and clinics are seeing a resurgence of respiratory illnesses, particularly in children. So you and I have had discussions for the last three years, and a lot of us in our profession have had discussions in the last three years of mask mandates, their effectiveness, um, how they've been politicized mm -hmm. by certain groups, particularly in my home country and my home state. I thought we had um, kind of passed that point of these discussions, so I was surprised yesterday to see Dr. Henry in the news rejecting a call for a mandate, other people requesting a mandate. So here we are in year three, and we're still having some of the same conversations. What are your thoughts around uh, this latest kind of kerfuffle uh, in, in British Columbia? Uh, well, it's happening here too in Ontario. Uh, just a little while ago, a few days ago, they were saying the same things that uh, they were calling for mask mandates for hospitals and some other institutions, schools, they, anything that's enclosed, um, but it's been rejected because, and you said it, politicized. And I think they're trying to avoid some of the uh, conflicts that occurred as a result of mask yeah. mandates. You know, we had the uh, the convoy in Ottawa that shut down downtown Ottawa that really disrupted um, not just government but the people that live there. The uh, where was it Windsor border crossing with Detroit. Um, there was one in Alberta and I think there was one in uh, British Columbia as well. And I think all these doctors now have are afraid to put their their full force you know or their 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 uh, opinions forward for fear of retribution of some sort of something happening which which is absolutely terrible I, I you know people that we entrust with our lives are now fearful of us so it it, it seems kind of weird that that's mm. happening but it, it's you know we everybody in this room right now 
we could say there's a mass mandate and there could could be, let's say, two people that don't like it. It'll be the fear of what those two people have to say or could do rather than the other 98 who will wear a mask. I think now they're making it more voluntary saying, you know, think logically if you're going to an old age home or, or a center like that, a hospital, uh, be considerate and wear a mask because those are health centers. So you should wear a mask because a lot of people wear them already. Um, but I think a lot of people are kind of looking at it. Well, don't tell me when to wear a mask. And you know, that's causing some of the issues right now, which is probably why the doctor in uh, BC kind of took a step back and just said, you know, I'm not going to support a mask mandate, but maybe you should think logically and wear one if you need to, you know, which is kind of wishy-washy, really. Yeah, it's been very interesting for me. When you're in emergency management and you're in the public sector of our profession, you have to balance public interest versus public perception. And this has been, I think, in my career, the most fascinating um, example of where public interest and public perception are the most out of alignment. I thought it was interesting, mm. again, that Dr. Henry mentioned around children, because I think, you know, one thing we talked about yesterday, my changing perception being in London uh, recently versus being in Florida, which chose to uh, ignore the pandemic for the last three years. You look at uh, a, a lot of the arguments or a lot of people are saying, well, there are vaccines now. And uh, myself, <coughs> my wife and my children were all vaccinated, but my children are old enough to be vaccinated. They're 16 and 18. We all got vaccinated. I think about the families uh, who have children who are under the recommended age. Mm. So, you know, part of some people's argument is, well, you have a choice to get vaccinated or not vaccinated. You have a choice to wear a mask or not a mask. So it all evens out in, in some miraculous way. But like you said, I want those people who don't have a choice. How are you protecting your families? I think we're going to look back at this. Um, to me, like I said, it's, it's the most interesting aspect of emergency management in my career where, you know, the public perception and the public benefit are the most misaligned on a single, a single item. Very interesting to me. It is. It, it, I, I can't help but think if a doctor came out and said, you know, if you wear a mask, it'll cure cancer. Would we respond the same way? Would we be upset? No, you're, you're in you're infringing on my liberties or my freedoms by wearing a mask. Well, you, you could be curing cancer. Uh, obviously, that's an extreme example, but, you know, just to illustrate a point. That would be a great you know, mask. It, it would be. And uh, one day, maybe that could be the case. Who knows? But um, still, it, it's kind of ridiculous that doctors who we rely on so much are fearful. Uh, that. I still can't wrap my head around that because anything my doctor says, I pay attention to, you know, my mm -hmm. health, my livelihood. And here it is, uh, doctors that are afraid to say wear a mask, you know, because of people that are, are vulnerable to other illnesses, you know, maybe they have uh, HIV or they diabetes is a big one, you know, cancer, uh, people with respiratory illnesses already, you know, my mother has that, you know, and, and really, you know, think about it. What would you do if you were a carrier and you got your own parents sick, you know, because of they, they had respiratory illnesses and the, you know, something terrible happened? Just think logically. Is the, that pain less than wearing a mask for a couple of weeks? Exactly. Well, we're at day two of continuity and resilience today. It is lunchtime in the exhibit hall. The exhibit hall is filling up with people eating lunch. Uh, Alex, in our segment when we were off the air, had to watch me eat a sandwich <laughs> in a quick and horrifying manner. I apologize to Alex for that. Uh, a lot of people here, a lot of people eating lunch, a lot of great conversations that we're, we're seeing. You can always kind of tell the vibe of a conference on the last day. And that yeah. lunch break, is it all sad? Does it feel like a funeral home? 
uh, or here, it feels like still the opening reception. It still feels like the first day. There's a lot of excitement, a lot of people still smiling, happy to be here. Uh, not a lot of people I find interesting on their phones. They're yeah, actually that's... all talking to each other, which is something really That nice is to really see. noticeable. I'm glad you pointed that out. Because usually, even in sessions, you have a lot of people staring at their phones yeah. and, you know, well, only one ear listening to what's going mm -hmm. on. But if you look around at all the different tables uh, that have people here, nobody is talking on the phone or typing out a message. They're really engaged with the other people at, at their tables. And I'm sure many of them don't know each other. Maybe some do. But I'm sure some don't. Hey, you, you attended a session with me. What did you think about it? And that's what seems to be going on, you know, which is great. You know, that, that makes it really electric. Absolutely. So yesterday we spoke about the missile attack, accidental missile attack in Poland. And you, you and our audience had to listen to me talk about the Cuban missile crisis for 12 minutes, which was probably 10 and a half minutes too long. <laughs> so I saw a little update on that this morning. NATO made some comments, uh, said NATO, I uh, saw this on the BBC today, NATO agrees with Poland's early assessment of Wednesday's missile strike that it most likely came from Ukrainian air defense. Uh, in speaking to the BBC, Secretary General Stoltenberg, and this is my favorite quote, said accidents happen. Yeah, but two people died. Uh, he further went on to emphasize the need for these types of mistakes not to spiral out of control, mm -hmm. which I think we all agree with, adding that there are lines of communication between the United States and Russia and also between NATO and Russia. So, Alex, let me bounce this off you. Um, from a crisis communication standpoint... Your thoughts on a leader in a crisis saying accidents happen? You know, it doesn't show a lot of compassion for what happened to me. It's more of, oh, well, oops. And, you know, in crisis management, you can't respond that way because that, that just doesn't look like you care, for one and that you're just going to dismiss it, you know, that uh, it's nothing to worry about, nothing to see here. But in this case, we've had, you know, there's a war going on. So there's a lot of suffering people right now. And in this particular case, there were two deaths. So I think turning around saying accidents happen is a little bit kind of cold to me. It's, it's a little bit cold and doesn't really say what happens. Like, oops. I shot my gun and two people died. Oh, well, mm, that, that doesn't really uh, show compassion or care or empathy or uh, communicate what the actual situation was. Yeah, I think uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg could have taken some advice from our friend Molly McPherson, mm. who has some guidelines that I always try to follow with crisis management communications. You know, part of her steps are first own the issue second explain why it happens and third share with the audience the steps you're taking so it won't happen again here uh, secretary Joe, uh, general stoltenberg went went to say that accidents happened and put the blame on russia which was another interesting thing i thought that russia was responsible for Ukraine shooting missiles in the Poland. So it's almost the opposite of Molly's philosophy where mm -hmm. the NATO did not take responsibility, blamed someone else, and outlined no steps of how they would accidentally fire missiles. And I, you know, I make this a big deal for a few reasons. First, like Alex said, first and foremost, this was a life safety event. Two people died because of this accident. And second, if I have an accident, if I spill some of my tea on myself today, so what? That's the end of the accident. I don't accidentally spill tea on myself and trigger a war. Yeah. Like that level of accident to me 
uh, is unacceptable and should have more severe consequences. So I thought or, that or was blame a, the people who made the, co the tea or coffee see, yes, at the other I'm, end of the I'm room. I'm going to blame my green tea company for spilling on myself. <laughs> but I thought that was interesting, you know, just as follow up to the conversation we had yesterday about this accident, but also through the lens of crisis communications. To me, this was a very poor example, or rather maybe a great example of what not to do yeah. during a crisis. Yeah, and, and especially in a crisis, you, you, one of the first things you have to do is address people. And Always. That's not even mentioned. So, you know, not, not even second or third or fourth. It, it just glossed right over. But you know, it, there's a war going on. Like I said, there's people suffering, and in that, I, I don't know if that's an apology or <laughs> or what it is, but it certainly doesn't address any people concerns. So, Alex, coming up in our next hour, we've got quite a few things happening. We have Regina Phelps. Oh, yeah. Who we're going to speak to. Um, I want to ask Regina, so she was making faces at us off camera. Do you think she'll be willing to make faces on camera? Let's ask her. <laughs> All right. Keep me in check for that. We're going to ask Regina if she's, if she's willing to do that. We've got... Um, approximately two hours left still mm -hmm. have a lot of material to cover very exciting i wanted to uh let's see what else uh, a follow-up i'll ask you a quick question this will take us five minutes or so well nothing takes us five minutes who am i kidding but well i'm optimistic so <laughs> following can't even up say yes or no <laughs> following up on our conversation yesterday around twitter and its layoffs amazon announced this morning that they plan to eliminate 10,000 jobs in their devices and services units. You spent a lot of time yesterday articulating um, how organizations need to be compassionate during these times. But I got to thinking logistically, how do you notify 10,000 people of a layoff? You mentioned a time when you were laid off, everyone was brought into a room I was part of an all company layoff, but it was 150 people, similar situation. We were all brought into a room. Mm -hmm. We all heard it all at once. We all heard it from our CEO, but as organizations get larger and they're global organizations, what are some thoughts? How would you lay off 10,000 people uh, with compassion? Certainly what we talked about yesterday was the worst way to do it. Well, I think they've, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought I heard something this morning. They're going to start off with trying to see if they can get anybody to retire early. Okay. So <clears throat> they're going to uh, put out packages, you'll buy out packages and see, see how much they get out of that. Let's say half of them. Well, then you're still left with how do you tell 5,000 other people uh, you know, that they're out of work? Um, I think with a company like Amazon, because those 5,000 people, I'm going to assume, are all over the place. Yes. You know, I don't know if it's North America specific or US or Canada specific or globally. Um, if it's globally, then they might actually just be, be able to actually be compassionate to have the manager call somebody in. You know, uh, you know each facility is letting go five people. Then they might be able to do that. If it's an entire uh, division that's going, um, then I, I don't know if there's an easy answer because you can't bring 5,000 people into a room, you know, uh, and, and, and say that you're going to lose a job. But at, at the same time, there's 5,000 people who just got to buy out or retire. Okay, there's 5,000 people that are losing their job, but we don't know who that's going to be. So there could be 20,000 people who are now stressed out which is not going to help you in other areas because no one knows who, who is it that's going to lose their, their job, what role is being cut back. So even though you may say, you know, Alex is the one going to lose their job, James is also feeling the same way. Yeah, I think there's a way to be thoughtful about it. Uh, I think you can do in person as much as possible. Certainly if I'm in 
Toronto and I report to an office in Vancouver, don't make me fly to Vancouver to lay me off. Yeah. And then I have to fly home. Those are cases where it does have to be virtual. It may have to be over Zoom. But to your point, if you have a pocket or a department or office of division of people, then I think companies should look at um, doing those layoffs, having the respect to do those in person. But that's a thoughtful yeah. methodology. I think a lot of these companies just take a shortcut. All 10,000 people get an email. All 10,000 people are on a Zoom or a Slack message. I think companies should look to minimize that emotional damage yeah. when possible. Certainly don't fly people across the country, across the world to get laid off. But if it makes sense that something's virtual, then then go ahead and do that. And, you know, there's there's a, a compassionate way and a more effective way to, to do these types of layoffs. Uh, was it last year there was a, uh, a CEO of a company who, uh, had a Zoom call and nobody knew what was going on and he fired. Like if you're on the Zoom call, you're fired? Yes. Something like that. Like that showed no compassion, no nothing. It was just out of the blue and that hit headlines and everything. If yeah. If I recall correctly. As it should. And, you know, again, for me, we've talked about this throughout the year. That's a business continuity issue for me because when you so severely damage your brand and reputation in that manner, People are not going to want to work for you. Yeah. So your applicants are going to go down and the people who are left are going to be looking to leave. And I've always yeah. felt that that's a business continuity issue. You damage your brand to the point that employees don't want to be there and applicants don't view you as an employer or worse, they view you as the employer of last resort. So what's the quality mm. of people you're getting to fly? The True, people who yeah. can't get a job anywhere else. And I think that's one of those aspects of business continuity. I wish we would spend more time and attention when brand and reputation damage. We often think of customers stop buying your products or services. But what about when your employees and your applicants stop buying you as an employer? Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, as a last resort, people come to your company. They could also just be... Uh, this, this is just a job I'm going to keep for a couple of months until something else comes along. So they never really get invested into it. Meanwhile, you've spent a lot of money onboarding, getting them set up, IDs, accesses, whatever the case may be. And in their mind, you know, uh, you're just here to pay the mortgage for two months and then I'm leaving. So. And that's how, that's how quiet quitting yeah. happens. Oh, hey, we came back to yesterday's that. topic. How's See, that? Uh, it was a long circle. <laughs> time is a flat circle, ladies and gentlemen. Alex, we're getting close to the end of our third hour. I want to thank again our sponsor today, uh, this hour, one of our featured sponsors across two days, Stone Road, a firm that aims to reduce corporate suffering by helping companies identify prepare for, respond to, and overcome adverse situations. We're certainly in the peak of lunch. The yeah. sound is rising. Yeah, the room is filling. The room so is full. So we'll take, uh, what, uh, about a 12, 13-minute break or so, and uh, we will be right back. If you like that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, Stay prepared, everybody.